what we're going to do tonight is, sorry, it's very sensitive, is we are going to quickly review the sort of role that our households have in, in carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and then simple things that we can all do quite easily to make a difference. And then go on to a bit more technical aspects, which is how we can actually start building or improving the building structure itself. And then we'll look at a case study of somebody who um, has gone to some length to try and reduce their carbon dioxide emissions. Um, the commercial ad about heat, I won't go through that. Um, so, about a quarter of all the carbon dioxide emissions in Scotland come from what we do in our houses. Um, heating our houses, making heating water, cooking, watching TV, mobile phones, gaming, all these sorts of things. Um, but we can all take power to reduce our energy use. And this image here is a thermal image, so it's showing the heat coming out of the house. And blue is good and red and white are bad in this image. So they are two semi-detached houses, as I was saying at the start, identical when they were built. And the house on the left, as you're looking at the screen, somebody has invested a lot of time in improving the energy efficiency of that house um, and it is now leaking a lot less heat. Either that or it's not heated. Uh, but I'm assuming the former that somebody has actually invested a lot of money to reduce the, en the energy uh, leakage of that house and we'll come to a very similar image later on in the presentation. Now why is this so slow? Right. How do we use energy in the house? Well, most of it goes on space heating, especially in Scotland, um, followed by water heating. And then all the other things, cooking, lighting, communication, which is an entertainment. That last one is an increasing proportion of how we use energy in the house. Um, I always thought that computers were fairly trivial in the scheme of things till I met a gamer the other week and we put an energy monitor onto their computer and it was running at peak at 1.2 kilowatts. Um, that's, that's a storage heater. That's a fairly heavy load, and that's people who are using specialist gaming computers. So communications entertainment having a complete com increasing share of the energy of use in households. Um, regardless of the size of your house, the average house in the UK uses about 400 kilowatts. That's electricity units uh, per square meter per year of energy. Um, an energy efficient home uh, can reduce that to 150 kilowatts. That's a massive saving. So a modern energy efficient house is 60% more energy efficient than the average house in, in the UK. Um, and the case study we'll be looking at later on is a 70 year old house where the householder has managed to reduce that figure to 160 kilowatts, getting pretty close to a modern standard, um, especially when their energy use includes plugging in an electric car. Um, and that house has annual CO2 emissions of two and a half tons, uh, whereas the average UK home has annual CO2 emissions of five and a half tons. So quite a substantial difference. Where does the heat go? This is an uninsulated house. And you can see, first of all, 35% of the house goes through, of the heat goes through the walls. Most people think that the ceiling, that the roof is where you lose most, but in an uninsulated house, it's, it's a proportion of the, of the surface area. Almost as simple as that. So 35%, a third of the heat is lost to an uninsulated wall, 25% to an uninsulated loft, single glazed windows 10%, drafts and air movement in the house 15%. This is something we often forget. We know that drafts are uncomfortable, but they're actually a major source of heat loss in older houses and 15% through the floors. I hope you're paying attention because questions will be asked later. Um, 
First of all, what are the simple things that we can do? I think, I'm, yeah, that don't cost anything at all, but can actually save us energy and save us money. Simple things, we all know about only putting as much water in the kettle as you want to, uh, and don't fill it every time. Turn off things you're not using. If I'm giving a, a, a talk like this to school children, I get them to put up their hands if they do various things. Um, and I let them take their hands down if, as they gradually answer questions. But we always end up with a group of kids who leave their hands up for about five minutes, which gets to be pretty sore. I then point out that this is just like leaving things on standby because it's a complete waste of energy. It's a good illustration of expending energy for no use at all. A simple one, opening a fridge and leaving a door open while you consider what you're going to make for dinner. Think about it beforehand. Um, dishwashers, um, I am my dishwasher, that's even more energy efficient. Um, tumble dryers, at this time of year in Scotland, an awful lot of people are running tumble dryers, but if you can avoid it, it does save an awful lot of energy. Having a shower instead of a bath is really efficient. It saves more than 80% of the energy cost. Um, and I should mention here that the most energy intensive product in your house is the water you use. Um, there's an enormous amount of energy used in just getting clean water to your house. The single biggest energy user in Scotland is Scottish water. Um, and the example I like to use from our area is Burnham. Uh, lives, you know, if you're living in Burnham, you're right beside the River Tay, you see all that water rolling past you every day. Your water comes from Perth. It is extracted from the River Tay in Perth, treated and filtered there, and then pumped all the way back up the hill to Burnham an enormous cost in energy. So reducing water consumption affects your bills, but it also affects Scotland's carbon footprint through Scottish water. Simple things about how you lay out your, your room. Um, a key one here at this time of the year, close your curtains well before dark, especially in rooms that you're not using. You're losing heat even through double glazed windows and drawing the curtains saves on that heat loss and an hour before dark at the very least you're losing a lot of energy through those windows draw your curtains i go around the house about four o'clock every day especially upstairs and i close everything then we get on to spending money to reduce energy consumption now that has gone wrong that slide let's i do know what has happened there i'm sorry that's very strange, it wasn't like that before. Uh, uh, LED light bulbs. Um, if you haven't already switched to LEDs, do so. They save an awful lot of energy, they last a lot longer, and if money is tight, prioritize on the rooms that, where you use lights most. So if you have a spare bedroom and nobody's ever staying there, you can leave it, but your living room, your kitchen, your dining room, get those lights switched as soon as you can and you'll get a very quick payback on those. And modern LEDs, the quality of light is fantastic and there's no reason for not switching. Um, I'm sorry about that slide, we'll just have to pop on from there. I don't know what has happened. Um, draft proofing, big thing. If you still have older, older windows, even older double glazed windows, they can be drafty. So going around and sealing the drafts around your windows and doors. Um, in my house, which is um, cavity wall, even the brick cavity, um, anywhere where there's a hole from the inside of the house into the brick cavity, such as where wiring is run, is a source of a draft. So sealing off any holes through the brickwork into the cavity in a, in a, a brick built house can save a lot of energy. And remember that slide I put up earlier, 15% of the energy loss in an older house can come from air movement alone. And one of the main aims of modern building is to make houses completely airtight to the extent that a completely airtight house has to have a, a forced mechanical ventilation system to allow air to change. Um, 
But trust me, in an older house, you don't need to do that because the energy is changing much more quickly than it would need to for health or dampness. Um, your, your, your floor is especially on the ground floor. Um, most houses of an, old, of an age, the ground floor will not be insulated. The simplest thing to do is to put carpets or rugs on top. Um, and if you're putting in new carpets, specify a heavy duty insulating underlay. It's not much extra cost and it saves an awful lot of money. If you have an open fire, an open chimney, sealing it during uh, when you're not using it. Um, if you're living in Blair Gary, the two bells will sell you one of these balloons quite nicely. Um, you can pop it up in the chimney, inflate it, and it will stop cold drafts from coming down. Um, if you want to use the fire, you just deflate it and remove it. And if you have a wood burning stove, when it's not in use, shut the vents. And the picture on the right there, you see one of these thermally driven fans, which can move hot air around the room to make your wood burning stove much more effective. Radiators. Um, this is especially true of your radiators are on the outside walls. Modern practice is to put radiators on internal walls, but if a radiator is on an external wall, putting some sort of reflective membrane behind it will reflect heat back into the room instead of heating up the wall behind it. And all radiators, if they are modern, should have thermostatic radiator valves on them. If not, get a plumber to check that they are um, plumbed in in a way that is suitable to have thermostatic radiator valves on them. And that means that you can set the heat in every room in your house and significantly reduce the heating demand. Loft hatches. Uh, before you insulate your loft, have a look at your hatch itself. Older hatches will be drafty and they will have no insulation at all. Simple thing is to just put a draft sealing strip around a good hatch and lay some insulation on top of it. This is a purpose-built insulated loft hatch here, um, which you can buy in Wix and B&Q. And it's a relatively straightforward job to get one of those fitted. A joiner could do one of those in less than two hours. And if you're competent, it's a, a do-it-yourself job. Loft insulation. Um, it's not that long ago that we talked about 150 millimeter, six inches in old money as being the, the target for loft insulation. The target now is 35 centimeters, 350 millimeters. That's a, a foot, more than a foot actually of insulation. And in fact, if you go to Germany, they will happily talk about twice that. Um, so extra loft insulation, it's very cheap and easy to do. If you're halfway competent as a do-it-yourself job, just make sure that the loft is still adequately ventilated on an older house. Glazing. Now, if your window frames are in excellent condition, in other words, if they're not rotted wood and if they're draft proof, then think twice before rushing out to get new double glazing. On most window frames, it is possible to get them reglazed um, up to modern standard for a fraction of the cost of brand new double glazing. Um, as you can see from the figures there, if you were looking at a return on investment, if you were a business, you would never double glaze. Uh, it's a payback period of up to 40 years, depending on the quality of double glazing you get, the company you get to install it. Um, however, if your windows are needing replacement anyway, then they will have to be replaced with modern double glazing. If they're in good condition and you can't install double glazing panes on them, you can go for secondary glazing. Uh, much cheaper, much quicker payback. Not as effective, but it's a good second best. And never forget the value of thick curtains or even shutters. 